Hello and welcome. It is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Today is day four of part two of NISA. Welcome to everyone for being here today. We have an outstanding webinar lineup for you. Today's webinar uh, is titled Aquatic Plant Management Priorities and it is sponsored by the Aquatic Plant Management Society. My name is Elizabeth Brown. I am your professional development, legislative affairs, and certified weed-free products program manager here at NASMA. And NISA is powered by NASMA. So before we get into today's webinar, I wanted to share a little bit about NASMA with those of you that don't know us well yet. Here at the North American Invasive Species Management Association is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. A little bit about what we do. We are the stewards of international standards, including our mapping standards and our certified weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. Education and advocacy, you are at NISA, National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It happens twice a year, and this week we are really focused on issues that are of importance at the state and local level. And again, so excited to be partnered with APMS for today's webinar. Outreach and awareness is a large cornerstone of what we do here at NASMA. Play Clean Go is our recreation campaign. Check it out at playcleango.org. We have Play Clean Go Awareness Week happening June 6th through 12th. So a lot of activity coming up next month. Stay in the know by staying up to speed at playcleango.org. And of course, professional development. We have our Invasive Species Manager Certification course. The spring semester is wrapping up now. Summer semester starts in June. Check that out on our website at nasma.org. Webinars and trainings just like this one. And of course, our annual conference. So save the date, our annual conference is September 27th through 30th in Missoula, Montana. We will have a hybrid option for those of you that are only able to join us virtually. So again, keep up to speed with that at nasma.org. And this year's conference is co-hosted with the Montana Invasive Species Council. If you're not yet a member of NASMA, I invite you to uh, visit our website and explore our options. We have three uh, individual membership options and four partner partnership options for you to consider. We're also willing to customize a partnership to meet your needs. One of my favorite NASMA benefits is our First Fridays, which is a virtual networking opportunity, members only. It's a lot of fun. We get to know each other and talk about what we're dealing with in our everyday lives, in our careers, and in this unified challenge to work against invasive species. So our next event is June 4th. We'll be talking public education and outreach. I hope that you will join us. Okay, so that's my opening for you. Again, our mission here at NASMA is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. Thank you so much for being here for day four of our NISA webinar series. Again, we have four outstanding speakers today. First up is Dr. Ryan Worsell, Assistant Professor Professor of Aquatic Plant Ecology in the Department of Biological Sciences at Minnesota State University. He teaches courses in general ecology, lake ecology, wetlands, and weed science. Ryan's research focuses on understanding the seasonal life history and characteristics and phenology of aquatic plants. Ryan is the president of the Aquatic Plant Management Society, associate editor for the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management, and Associate Editor of Invasive Plant Science and Management. So I'm going to invite Ryan. Everyone, please, if you have questions for any of our speakers today, put them in the Q&A box in the center of your Zoom screen on the bottom. And if you see a question that you really want somebody, like you were going to ask the same thing, click the like button and that'll promote it to the top of the queue. We'll save all the questions to the very end. So we'll hear from all of our presenters. Dr. Greg Bugby is going to be our second presenter from the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. Then we're going to have Jeremy Crossland and Mike Greer with the Army Corps of Engineers, and then we'll follow that up with the Q&A. All right, so with that, I am going to stop my share and go ahead and let you share, Ryan. And just so everybody knows, this webinar is being recorded and will get posted to NASMA's public YouTube channel as just as quick as we can get it processed and put up there. Okay, thank you so much. Just go ahead and click into presenter mode. All right. 
Thank you, Elizabeth and Nazma and everybody for joining this afternoon. My name is Ryan Wurzel. As Elizabeth said, I'm the current president of the Aquatic Plant Management Society, well, for at least about the next six weeks, and then I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Ryan Thume from Montana State University. And today I'm just going to give an overview of where the Aquatic Plant Management Society got its start, why it was formed, and kind of how it has evolved over the years into what it is today. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Aquatic Plant Management Society. This may be new for some of you. And then Dr. Bugby and, and Jeremy and Mike are going to give a, a pretty good overview of, of what we're all about as far as boots on the ground type projects. So APMS was formed in 1961 and really was one of the first organizations solely dedicated to invasive species management. And from those early days, it was formed to tackle water hyacinth and the invasion of water hyacinth across Florida and then you know outside of Florida as it has spread. And it was a way for managers to get together and to share information as to what they're doing, what's been working, what hasn't been working, maybe what needs to be changed. And, you know, all of that whole sharing of information, you know, was, was kind of the cornerstone that the society was built on. And it remains one of the pillars of what that, what our society is today. And, you know, mother nature, as things move around, we quickly expanded our scope from water hyacinth to include hydrilla in the late 1960s. As we move into the 1970s, we really broadened the scope, went from Florida focus and started to expand nationally. And, and largely this was due to the expansion and the movement of hydrilla and with the incoming threat that Eurasian water milfoil posed to the country. And since we were broadening our scope and broadening, you know, kind of our reach, the society changed its name from the Hyacinth Control Society and, and becomes what it's known as today, the Aquatic Plant Management Society. And with that broadening of scope, we realized that there were, you know, definite regional issues, state issues, regional issues that were becoming apparent across the country as weed issues increased. So a number of regional chapters were formed in during the 1970s, the Florida chapter, the South Carolina chapter, the Mid-South chapter, and the Midwest chapter. And again, I, I talked a little bit ago about the pillars of what the society is built on. One of them, you know, is that sharing of information. The other one is the student involvement in bringing students into this professional setting with you know the goal of expanding their professional network, get them in front of people, get them doing science, get them talking about science. So our first student paper contest was held in 1974 at the annual meeting. And then the journal, what was the Hyacinth Control Journal, the name was changed to the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management. So the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management is one of our, what well, is our main vehicle for transmitting scientific information. In the 80s, we partnered with the Weed Science Society of America, and we do have representation on the board of directors of Weed Science Society of America. Aquatic Plant Management Society is a recognized regional chapter of WSSA. And there are a number of members of APMS that sit on the board of directors for WSSA and across all of their committees and, and committee chairs. We've been collaborating with NOMS, the North American Lake Management Society, for a number of years. And we've got one of these collaborative efforts that I'll talk about here in a little bit. And we held the first International Water Milfoil Symposium in Vancouver, Canada in the 80s. And there's actually a special issue of the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management that was a product of that particular meeting. Two additional reg regional chapters came on board, the Western Aquatic Plant Management Society and Texas Aquatic Plant Management Society. And, you know, as we increased the scope of what we were 
looking at as far as weed issues, the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management also increased its scope. And we are starting to see more and more papers focusing on algae, water lettuce, duckweed, spike rush, pond weeds, you know, things again that were more maybe regional in scope, but were causing some significant threats to local water resources. In the 1990s, we saw one of our longstanding and, and best partners, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, there was some reduced or reduction in federal funding. So that, you know, caused a change in direction for APMS. And we really looked at support and partnering with states that were having, you know, significant aquatic plant management issues and really got involved in Minnesota and Washington looking at developing specific aquatic plant management strategies for problems that we're having. Obviously in Minnesota, it was Eurasian water milfoil and in Washington, there was milfoil and then maybe even some agaria densa back then. We created the first graduate student research grant in the nineties. And the first one was awarded in 1998, you know, me being a recipient of the graduate research award, not in 1998, but in, in, in 2000s, I can say this really, you know, does benefit student involvement in the society. It also helps to train and mentor that next group of aquatic plant management society, scientists. So that program is, is very good and very well received. Created some outreach opportunities with Bass. Had, we held another international meeting in Daytona. And then our last chapter, the Northeast Aquatic Plant Management Society, was you know brought into the fold, so to speak, in 1999. And the Journal of Aqu Aquatic Plant Management started to broaden again, looking at more plant physiology and paying more and more attention to non-target impacts of management. So, you know, regardless of what management strategy that we were using, mechanical, biological, chemical, yes, we know that we can control in most cases the target weed, but what were we doing to the whole plant community? You know, what were those community effects? What were those non-target effects? And we were seeing more and more emphasis being placed on those types of studies in the journal during this time period. In the early 2000s, we increased the funding for the graduate research student grant. Right now we're at $40,000 for each graduate student grant and we offer that every other year. So it's, again, it will pretty much fund a master's student and it will partially fund a PhD student. We brought in student poster and presentation competitions at our annual meeting and developed a aquatic plant management activity book that was geared towards maybe grade school, middle school children and, you know, put out 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million copies nationwide. The book is still out there. I think we need to revamp it for an electronic format. We just haven't had the wheels to make that happen. Uh, APMS and its members work very closely with industry and with the US EPA on registering, testing new herbicides. In the early 2000s, it was herbicides for hydrilla after fluoridone resistant hydrilla was found in Florida. We needed to find some new tools, get some new tools in the toolbox to address those resistance issues. Again, APMS worked with EPA and industry, and we got two new herbicides registered fairly quickly to address those resistance issues. Early 2000s, we recognized that harmful algal blooms were becoming more and more prevalent and more and more of a problem nationwide. And we started to devote more and more attention to HABs, cyanobacteria, and the issues that they were causing nationwide. In 2010s, APMS broadened its focus to the ecology and management of aquatic plants, and we revised our mission and vision statements to include LG, cyanobacteria, harmful algal blooms, that whole complex of issues there. So we weren't strictly focused only on vascular aquatic plants anymore. We took a more, I guess, inclusive approach and included algae in there as well. APMS funded a special graduate research project on Starry Stonewort, which was a collaborative effort between many of our regional chapters and 
APMS and some industry donations as well. Uh, some members created the white paper, a manager's definition of aquatic plant control. So those of you that have been out in the field, whether it's aquatic or terrestrial otherwise, when people hear control management, you know, there's a whole slew of definitions or meanings or you never know what people are thinking when they hear control management. This white paper kind of lays it out from a management perspective and, and kind of, you know, puts it into perspective of what stakeholders should be doing or how to convey that information to stakeholders. APMS and its collaborators funded a paper by CAST, the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology, on the benefits of controlling nuisance of aquatic plants, so why we do what we do and why that's important, both from an ecological point of view and from an you know, economical point of view. APMS enters social media space, so LinkedIn, Twitter, I've got another slide here later on. I'm, I'm not very good at social media, so we'll get to that slide here in a little bit. And Journal of Aquatic Plant Management, again, increases its readership. We had 211 articles published during this time, which for a journal that comes out twice a year, that's a, a fair number of articles that's being circulated you know, solely on aquatic plant ecology and management issues. So APMS today, we are a society. We want to assist in promoting the management of nuisance aquatic plants, you know, help to provide science-based information to stakeholders, to the general public, to industry, to legislators, if need be, and look at, you know, growing our reach as far as academia, government, private, public individuals, you know, and just be there to disseminate information. And again, that, that cornerstone that I touched on earlier about being a society to give out information, and that's really what we do with the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management and our annual meetings. We want to bring people together so that we can disseminate that science-based information to advance aquatic plant and algae management. The board of directors currently looks like this. Again, this is going to change in July at our annual meeting. So I am the president and our executive boards include a president elect, a vice president, immediate past president and treasurer. And again, our board of directors is a mix of academia, industry and government individuals. This year we're going into a very, a major website update. We are going to make it more mobile friendly for iPhone, smartphones, and just clean it up a lot. So information is easier to access, a little cleaner look, improve navigability both on the front end and then the workings behind. And, you know, just to, to streamline the process better. Social media, Twitter, Instagram, there's our addresses or however you get a hold of us. Facebook, LinkedIn, we have about 1,400 members on our LinkedIn page. Amy Giannotti, our secretary, is the one who organizes all of this. So if you have any questions about our social media, I would direct you to her. The journal update, last year, we decided to go all digital for the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management. This will allow us to take color photos and color figures more easily and more economically. It's going to have a much more updated and modern look and actually give us a greater ability to disseminate the journal more broadly, faster. And it'll be easier to promote from a social media aspect as well. Now, as far as ongoing collaborations, I mentioned some of these. PMS has a real good longstanding partnership with the Corps of Engineers. And this was a fall webinar series that we co-hosted with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're doing NAOMA today. We've done some collaborations with CAST. And with respect to NALMS, for those of you that are NALMS members, we have an upcoming summer series with NALMS strictly focused on harmful algal blooms and drinking water issues. And that's being co-hosted by AWWA, NALMS, the Corps of Engineers, and APMS. So if you have time and are willing to log into another webinar 
I would highly recommend tuning into that one. Our upcoming annual meeting is in New Orleans from July 12th through the 14th. We are having a hybrid meeting this year. So there will be an in-person portion that's taking place July 12th through the 14th, where we will have in-person live talks. And then we are going to have a virtual meeting sometime around July 27th, 28th, and 29th, where the talks that we did in person are going to be recorded and will be available for the virtual meeting. And then we have a whole nother part of the agenda where people that were not able to attend in person will have the opportunity to give a virtual presentation there. And then our 2022 meeting is gonna be in Greenville, South Carolina. So again, if you're at all interested in APMS and what we do, I would encourage you to sign up, become a member, or if you've got other questions, flag me down, any one of our board of directors, and we'll get you all of the information that you need. I'm just gonna acknowledge Jeff Shart, much of the history of Aquatic Plant Management Society was made by Jeff Shart and was recorded by Jeff Shart. He retired from Florida last year and APMS is, is forever indebted for the work that Jeff Shart has done for the society. And again, if you've got any questions about APMS, please send them my way. And if I can't answer them, I will get you to the people that can. Thank you again, everybody for tuning in and I'll hang out later for questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciated some of that history. And I'm definitely going to save the date for those webinars this summer. Those look great. Okay. Next up today is Dr. Greg Bugby. He is an associate scientist at the Connecticut Agriculture experiment station where his career has spanned over 35 years. He is the principal investigator in the invasive aquatic plant program. He has led aquatic plant surveys of over 350 Connecticut lakes and ponds and directed research priorities on invasive aquatic plant control statewide. He has numerous popular and scientific publications and is the recipient of the 2015 Journal of Aquatic Plant Management Outstanding Paper Award. He currently leads efforts to determine the extent of an alarmingly large infestation of a new strain of hydrilla in the Connecticut River and how it can be managed. I'm absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Bugby here. Go ahead and share your uh, slideshow and take it away. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'm going to be talking today on what I think is maybe one of the most significant invasive aquatic plant problems to occur nationally. Here in Connecticut, we have now an extensive population of hydrilla in our largest river, which is the Connecticut River. And the Connecticut River runs actually from Connecticut all the way up to the Canadian border. So it goes through, you know, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and we now have this population of hydrilla in the river in Connecticut primarily that threatens uh, the northern sections of the river to Canada and threatens to move throughout these states potentially into some other rivers and lakes and ponds. <coughs> and uh, for those of you who don't know anything about the Connecticut River, I mean, it is a real treasure. It's, it is an extremely valuable habitat for everything from eagles to fish and that sort of thing. It's, it was named an American Heritage River. It's the first national blue way a river. And again, a very important habitat. I have a, this is a, during our survey, some of the fish populations you see, this happens to be a, a school of what's called striped bass, which is a very common fish here in uh, the Northeast. And it uses uh, the river to forage for, you know, bait fish and that sort of thing. But there's a lot of other fish that are very important, including what's called menhaden which this is sort of a um, breeding grounds for these uh, small fish. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. And, and let me just go to the next slide. Now, it was mentioned that I do run an invasive aquatic survey program. We've done that since 2000, 2004, actually, in the state of Connecticut, where we have um, been going around to various lakes and ponds, trying to take an inventory of what plants are in them and particularly what invasive species are um, present. And so far, we've um, been to 306, or excuse me, 246 lakes, many of them more than once, uh, and we've 
done a total of 366 surveys. And you can see from this map, there's a lot of different invasive species in Connecticut. There's uh, 14 of them, which are reasonably common. The most common is Eurasian water milfoil, and it's one, probably one of the bigger problems in the state to this date. It's sort of a plant, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Kind of people have kind of gotten used to it, and you don't really hear that much about its research on it and that sort of thing anymore, but still is our, our biggest problem. Hydro There's a lot of other ones, but hydrillo has only been found in three lakes in the state of Connecticut. Now, I'm not talking about the Connecticut River right now, but you know, only in three lakes. So it's not very common. It's not very common in Connecticut. We think one of the reasons for that, it's more of a southern plant although certainly it can grow here, but uh, it's only been found in three, in three lakes, uh, excuse me, uh, that's the wrong way, sorry, in the state. And, and you can see where they are here and uh, spread out throughout the state, but they're very minor infestations. In many cases, they're being controlled, but not really anything that has been what one consider a nuisance, but certainly a, a concern. Now, the Connecticut River, this was back about five years ago. We got a sample of a plant from the river that people wanted to know what it was. And we looked at it and we said, it kind of looks like hydrilla, it kind of looks like elodea, and it kind of looks like agaria. And we were a little confused at first. Uh, we initially thought it was agaria, Brazilian waterweed, due to the fact it was a rather robust plant, much more robust than the types that we see of the hydrilla here, typically in Connecticut lakes. But we, we had other experts look at it and we all scratched our head and we said, yeah, this is definitely hydrilla. For those of you who are not familiar with hydrilla, it is a, basically it's considered the, the most troublesome submersed plant in the Southeast. And as you go North, it becomes less and less of an issue. It has the ability to spread in many ways. It has these underground structures called tubers which are kind of like a small potato, if you will, they're only like a quarter of an inch long or so, but they will stay in the sediment as a propagule for many years, maybe five to 10 years, depending upon what research you look at. So they're a problem when controlling it, because even if you control the top growth, you will have these in the sediment, which can re-sprout. And it's difficult to control these with any type of management that we know of, herbicides, what have you. On the stems, it has these turions, which again, they're a vegetative propagule, that break off and can reproduce the plant. So it has many ways of reproduction. That's why it's so difficult to control. In the river, we have to worry about one, th one thing in particular, and that is the native eelgrass beds. And these are this is not the saltwater eelgrass, it's freshwater eelgrass, Valisneria americana, but it is thought to be an extremely valuable habitat for fish and, and other organisms. And when we're talking about this Hydrilla, we're worried about, you know, it taking over, here it is here. In many cases, it's kind of taking over the habitat that the eelgrass once had, and it's unknown what that's going to do to the ecosystem. So we're worried about that, and we're also worried about when we do some management, can we control the hydrilla without damaging these eelgrass beds? We're going to get into that in a minute. So in 2019, we started our survey work on the river to determine exactly where this hydrilla was and what its abundance was and, and that sort of thing, what sort of a problem it was. We were able to do the southern third of the river in 2019. This is using our lake survey methods with GPS systems on boats and doing polygons around the patches of the various invasive species. We didn't just do hydrilla, which is the tan markings here, but we also did milfoil, Eurasian water milfoil, and water chestnut, which is there, and fanwort. These are other ones which are in a smaller amount, but certainly of concern. Our charge was to do all the invasive species as part of the survey, and including obviously hydrilla. You can see here from this southern section, this is Long Island Sound here, the southern section of Connecticut, that you really don't see hydrilla until you start to get up a few miles. This Long Island Sound is salt water, and it apparently hydrilla is not going to do too well in the more salty uh, conditions down here. But as you get up a few miles inland up the river, you begin to see it. And this is the northern section of the river that we did in 2020. Again, this is hard to see here, but it's a long river and I couldn't really do much else with it. Other than to say that hydrilla is throughout the river system all the way up into Massachusetts, a short distance into Massachusetts, Agawam, Massachusetts. If we look at our acreages we found from the polygons, if we add up the polygons around these patterns of the various invasive species, curly leaf pineweed, Eurasian water milfoil, fanwort, hydrilla, variable leaf milfoil, and water chestnut, you can see hydrilla is by far the most abundant now in the river. 
we can tell from some aerial photographs that 10 years ago, this plant, you could not pick it up on aerial photographs, and now you can certainly see it. But so there's 774 acres in mainly along the shoreline and in the coves of the river and in some tributaries. We do not see it more than two meters deep, and most of it's less than three meters deep excuse me, less than one meter deep, I should say, in the river. It's in the shallows for the most part, but it's particularly a problem in some coves. If we look at kind of what we're seeing in the river, again, this is more like you'd see in very much the southern states. And this is rather alarming that we would see much of the river, this is all hydrilla, a little bit of algae mixed in, but you can see here from this video that, you know, this is one extensive population of this plant in the river. We look at another picture here, wait for this to run out. You can see it's it's throughout in these more shallow areas. This is uh, some drone footage of, of a tributary, the Matabasset River, again going into the Connecticut. And this is all hydrilla here with just an, a narrow area or a boat lane going up through it. So this is just dense, you know, completely topped out hydrilla very unusual for a northern state. You can say why, you know, is it climate change? Is it this, is it that? I don't, I think that's still to be determined. Now there's something very unusual about this hydrilla and we actually sent it out to Ryan, to, excuse me, Nick Tipperary of Wisconsin to do genetics. And he was able to determine that the genotype of this hydrilla has never been sequenced before. So there's been a lot of sequences of hydrilla and a lot of different genotypes, but this is something that has not been recorded before. So it's different and it looks different. And there's some things that, I, that are, are different that may be an advantage when we come to treating it. The first thing is we have not yet found any tubers. I was out there yesterday with the tuber core, taking sediment samples in beds of uh, now beginning to grow hydrilla. We did not find any, not a one, and we've never found one in the, this will be the third year of looking of uh, tubers. So that's very unusual. And I think it's part of the genotypical difference, but very unusual. And certainly to not have tubers could be a huge advantage from a standpoint of control. We do find some turions. We find these structures that look like turions at the base of the plant and some on the stems, but we're not sure what that, whether they're a big player in its reproduction. I can tell you from work that was done just yesterday by myself that we were finding this plant regrowing from stem fragments that had overwintered. Almost entirely all the plant samples we took were from stem fragments. That again, could be an advantage in the management of it, that we do not have these long-term propagules. When we're talking about management, Connecticut River has some serious issues from a standpoint of how do we manage it? Uh, I mentioned the eelgrass issue, uh, but there is over 200 miles of shoreline in Connecticut alone. There is strong river flow. Here I am pushing the boat uh, in a shallow area against the river. It, it is much like the Hudson River and some of these bigger rivers with some serious river flow that's going to affect what we do if it's herbicide treatment, that sort of thing. It is also tidal in Connecticut for at least two thirds of it as we head north towards Massachusetts, where actually some of this hydrilla comes out of the water at low tide and seems to survive quite well. So that's an issue. There's also a, a fair amount of siltation, this silt here we're in any kind of boat that goes by or even tidal flow stirs up silt and at certain times of the, the, the day you can have just muddy looking water and some herbicides will be affected by that. There's also a large number of state listed species. It could be hundreds of them throughout the river which need to be counted for when say using an herbicide. This happens to be a picture of a sturgeon and we did see some during our survey there uh, last year. And there's a large number of towns and stakeholders who are going to probably want to have some uh, say in what is what goes on. So permitting through our state Department of Energy and Environmental Protection is going to be a challenge, but not certainly impossible. Research is needed. We are starting that now. We are out there looking at how this plant is re reproducing, how it's coming back from over the winter. And we're going to be moving forward with some, some studies on some herbicides. And actually we had did some work with a bottom blanket in a marina this year, which turned out I thought very well, we thought putting a bottom blanket down in a flowing river would be an issue. We did it in an incoming tide and it was really quite easy. I was surprised. 
So that could have some effect. So we're doing research and hoping to do more. I'm going to kind of end here. I'm not going to go over all the acknowledgements, but a lot of people are involved in getting this project going on the river and getting funding for us and others, pushing it forward in, with our uh, legislators and making them aware of it for potential future funding. Just to give you an idea of the Connecticut section of the river, there's been a, an estimate that to treat it with something like, say, Priscillacore, which we don't know will work yet, needs study could be in the area of $25 million a year. So, you know, that's some serious money and where that could come from, who knows, but it, you know, I think, you know, it's going to have to be a project that's going to be with many stakeholders, many participants, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Corps of Engineers could easily get involved here. I know we have some on the, that I've worked with listening right now and going to be up next. Being this is, is considered a regional project, regional problem that if this moves to other regions, it could be a serious one. So it's going to take, I think, a regional effort in the long haul to, to get this under control. With that, I'll end, and uh, I guess I'll stick around later for any questions. Okay, thank you so much. That's really interesting. I appreciate you presenting that. All right, we're going to move on now. Just try to keep us uh, on time. We have two more speakers today, both with the Army Corps of Engineers. They're going to tag team the next presentation. We have Michael Greer, who's a regional te technical specialist for ecosystem restoration with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Buffalo District and has over 20 years of water resource management experience. Michael has program oversight responsibilities for the Corps Invasive Species portfolio of projects within the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and has been leading the agency's response to Monetius hydrilla in this region since 2014 with a variety of partners. Michael is also a member of the Aquatic Plant Management Society and currently serves on its board of directors. Michael will be co-presenting with Jeremy Crossland, who has worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers since 1998, primarily working in invasive species management from backpack sprayer to policy development, in addition to supporting national programs for prescribed fire management and other natural resource management actions. When Jeremy is not working, he is trying to teach his munchkin how to fish, something I also spend my free time trying to do. <laughs> All right, thank you both for being here so much. I can see your screen great. Go ahead and take it away, Mike. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Appreciate the prior talks, really set things up well here for us to come down the home stretch this afternoon. I'm just gonna present the first couple of introductory slides here and teed up for Jeremy to share some examples of invasive species management. Go ahead, second slide, Jeremy. So um, just sharing this slide with you to give you a, a feel for some of the natural resource management topics or areas that, that touch our agency. We've actually got a tremendous amount of natural resources within our management. And I don't bring that up to brag, but it, it's really just, I think, demonstrates how exposed um, we are as an agency to invasive species, whether it be management or oh, prevention. What is going on? Um, so we got a tremendous amount of exposure. We're constantly trying to budget and implement management and prevention control measures across the lands that we manage, whether it be terrestrial species or aquatic invasive species, aquatic invasive plants, some of which might be hydrilla, hyacinth, alligator weed, and so on. Some of the other areas that invasive species touch the core would be with respect to some of our projects, right? It could be Everglades restoration or prevention of invasive carp from entering the Great Lakes through the Mississippi system. In addition to that, we have two research programs for the control of invasive species. We have an aquatic plant control research program and an aquatic nuisance species research program where we work with other federal, state, university partners, many others to try and come up with um, better ways to prevent and manage invasive species. And next slide. Okay, we spend a lot of money on invasive species every year. Most of it is in the control realm. We sort of laid out the other areas that, that we expend funds on related to invasive species management. Just because you spend a lot of money on something doesn't mean everybody appreciates the results of that. One of the challenges that we have is communicating the benefits of this work. It's certainly 
a challenge that I think most people that work in the invasive species realm can sympathize with, but we're constantly trying to come up with articulate ways to demonstrate the benefits of both the management and prevention of invasive species uh, within the lands that we manage. Sorry. So regardless of how you look at it, we see tremendous amount of return, ecological and economic, the funds that we spend on invasive species uh, management and prevention. Not always easy to articulate, but we know the benefits are there. And again, that's something that we are constantly working on. Better ways to do is to communicate that to the stakeholders and public for that work. Then before I turn it over to Jeremy to share some examples with us, I would just say, you know, management versus prevention is really just relative to your position in many cases, right? One person's control is another person's prevention, you know, and that might be with respect to some of the hydrilla work that we're doing in the Northeast or the expansion of some of the Southern invasive species that we see into more Northern climates. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeremy. All right. So I'm just trying to make sure that you never ask me to do anything again, Elizabeth, just for the record between this and last time, it's about as unsuccessful as I've ever been on web. But to Mike's point, you know, I mean, we're all weed killers, invasive species managers, prevention and long-term management. We always want to stop the next one coming in, but there's a lot of reasons why we continue to manage these other ones. Even like some people say lost cause, you know, water hyacinth is a good example. Like it's here forever, right? Maybe genetically someday there's something we can do that will change that, but Right now, it's a lot of 24D and diquat and a lot of man hours. And there's a good reason we do all that work, right? And so that's what we were going to talk about is why we've been managing some of these species for uh, a long, a long time. So, so we got a bunch of examples, kind of regional, and I know we are shorter on time. You know, red pine scale in New Hampshire, Northeast, right? It's killing trees, and we are trying to keep that in check. We work with Forest Service and uh, state agencies and just, I mean, like really cutting trees is about your only like great management tool right now. But I mean, it's something that people are doing all the time to try to keep it at bay where it is present. Spotted lanternfly, you can kind of see this on both sides to Mike's point, right? Like, is this early detection rapid response or is it long-term management now, right? Like the cat's out of the bag. We, I mean, we got people doing work on it. And unfortunately, I think it's here to stay. And so it's kind of shifted from let's kill it and get it out of here to what are we going to do with it for the next 20 years? You know, it continues to expand. It continues to be an issue. It's a scary species. It just, yeah. And I mean, we got projects that have, you know, I guess if they can get rid of all their tree of heaven, then maybe the story is different, but getting rid of all of our tree of heaven, I think that puts Greg's uh, $25 million a year number. It's probably not even in the ballpark of what it would cost the Corps of Engineers to eliminate tree of heaven in the Eastern and Northeast. So zebra mussels, are they a success story or are they a crisis, right? Like Waco Lake in Texas, I would say they're a success story. We had an issue. We boomed off a of marina we did a, a treatment and they've never seen them again but they're a disaster other places in the country right and they continue to cause that issues for us from navigation and flood control to environmental issues in the great lakes so they kind of hit all that spectrum right and in the columbia basin we're still trying to prevent and then in the eastern united states in a lot of places we're just learning to live with them and we're trying to figure out what they're doing to our concrete and our lock structures. It just, they run the whole gamut, right? Of left to right, like prevent, stop, eradicate the whole thing. And, and there's a lot to think about there, right? Like what's more important, prevent or maintain them at bay where they are. And it's just, you know, again, to that point, like it's a careful balance of how we do that. So, and then Great Plains, Eastern Red Cedar, it's a native species, but like where we don't have fire, it is, it's running over our prairie and that habitat that has been, you know, essentially tilled over for a lot of the country. So it's just the thing like, it's, 
I mean, arguably not a simple thing to manage, but it is a, like fire and some herbicide, right? And you can keep it at bay, but it's every year, every day, it's popping up in the prairie. It's doing what it does. It's trying to be an early succession species. And we're trying to maintain grasslands. And so, again, it's kind of in a, is this the early detection rapid response or is this long-term management? But we've been at it for 50 years out in Kansas and Nebraska and trying to keep it, make sure it's only a small part of our habitat on those prairie lands. Another one that everybody's familiar with, I think, but water hyacinths, right? 1898, we've got all the stories, like this is the core, Florida, Louisiana, this is our first invasive species. Maybe not, but it's the one we recognize and the Army and the Corps of Engineers and the state of Florida and the state of Louisiana have been battling it literally since the 1800s, right? And we've spent countless dollars. I mean, probably we don't even have a good number, but the day we stop doing it, it's right back there, right? It comes back every day. It's growing. We don't know how long the seed bank lasts. Anyway, but so it's long-term management, right? And the benefits of that is better habitat. It's, you know, better ecosystem. It's better navigation. It's flood control structures that aren't plugged up with water hyacinths. So there's a reason, there, there's good reason why we're picking that as something as a priority, right? And that's what we were trying to get across with this. Like Mike said, we spent a lot of money and the people that the people that need to know that sometimes don't understand why we want to kill weeds with that money, right? Like there's got to be something else you can do besides this. But that's what we have to show them is why we have maintained water hyacinth in Florida and Louisiana for a hundred years. So already came up, right? But it's the same story, right? Like in the Southeast, it's prevalent. And we're trying to keep it at bay and we're trying to keep it from dominating the landscape of our reservoir. Whereas in the Northeast, they're trying to get rid of it or keep it out. And there's benefits to both, right? Like we don't need more of it. We don't need that monotypical single species underneath the water. We don't want that. I mean, for multiple purposes, right? Environmental and flood control. I mean, we have hydropower plants that get clogged up with not just hydrilla, but any floating or bottom species and or any like submerged species so we're just trying to maintain them in a balance and manage them for the multi-purpose for all the purposes that we we're managing a reservoir salt cedar is another example right our guys out west battle this we battle it in the southeast a little bit also but i mean it's there it's basically been the species of the floodplain for a lot of our reservoirs for a long time, but it's not great habitat. It's not providing the habitat that we're trying to have at the reservoir. And, but it's coming back every year, right? You're going to spend money on it. It's not going away in a permanent limit. New technology may change that. Like we might have the ability at some point, but it's not ever going to, it's not just going to disappear because we spent money this year. And so we have to tackle it on an annual basis and spend that money because the habitat and the floodplain that is there without the species is way better than what we have when it's the only species in the floodplain. So we've got, like you, I'm clicking through them. It's kind of the same story, right? There's a reason we want to spend money and keep this species at bay, but because I know we're getting very close or past time, I guess, maybe, Elizabeth. That's okay, oh. go ahead and share. Sure. All right, so same story, right? Russian olive, you got the people that are out west know this species, just like we know autumn olive in the Midwest, or honeysuckle in the Southeast, right? They just dominate the landscape. And when it's there, nothing else is there. So annually, we gotta put people to work. You know, it's backpack sprayers, machetes, it's real work and it costs money. But what you have at the end of the day is far more valuable than what we had at the beginning. And there's a reason that we want to prioritize doing this work every year. And again, it's not to say that prevention, it sounds argumentative, I guess, but right, like they're both so valuable, right? We don't want a new species in, but these species until technology changes or we figure something out new that we haven't figured out yet, they're going to dominate your landscape and 
they they're, they're not providing good habitat. They're not good for flood control, navigation, all the things that we're trying to do at our projects. And so we have made the investment that we've got to spend money on them every year, right? And again, I know all the folks on the phone know these. They're not, they're not glamorous species, and it's not anything that if you're working in the region, you don't already know, right? But honeysuckle, right? I mean, it like my parents' house in the Midwest, it's terrible. It's the only thing that is underneath an oak tree or a walnut tree, any place. But it's not providing great habitat, and it's very specific to some species that may benefit, but everything else in the landscape is gone if it's underneath your trees. And so we've got projects all over the Midwest that are spending money every year to just keep it at bay, right? Flowering rush, let's some places it's new, right? It's prevention and we don't want it to show up in our reservoir, but some places it's just been there and it's time to kill it, maintain it, and just, you know, not let it impact things like hydropower and the environment. It's challenging to control. I would say, I don't know, maybe it's expensive. It's not any more expensive than anything else you're doing in the aquatic environment, but it's labor intense, challenging to control. And it impacts a, a niche environment of that, you know, a foot deep to five feet deep of the edge of your reservoir or your river. And yeah, it becomes the only thing that's there. And it's not good for anything that we've figured out in the world of native species, especially in the Western US. So anyway, we're doing a lot of cool things, trying to figure out better ways to control it. You can see on the right side of the screen, right, bubble curtain, the research programs that Mike mentioned, right? We're trying to figure out the best way to do business with this species. But at the end of the day, it takes money, manpower, and dedicated effort to keep it at bay. And again, we've figured out, or we've decided that it's worth the investment versus what's not there when flowering rush is there, right? And, you know, we're trying to say that not trying to say we're, you know, we're seeing that Northern Pike in the Western US are associated with the flowering rush beds, right? Which is not good for salmon, for young of the year salmon and all these things that we can attribute to the reason we want to invest money in just keeping it at bay. So kind of breeze through a couple of the last ones, but at the end of the day, like Mike had mentioned, we spend a lot of money and we have a crew I'm very proud to be a part of and Mike is also a part of the Corps of Engineers has our invasive species leadership team. And we got people from all regions of the US trying to work together to come up with better ways to do business in this world or better ways to do business, whether it is a long-term management issue and trying to control water hyacinth for the best bang for your dollar, or if it's trying to educate the public on why not to move a water hyacinth or a spotter and lander fly, right? And that's what, this slide is really, we have this pretty cool trunk, educational materials, and it's one-stop shopping for a park ranger or a natural resource manager to be able to like educate folks on the reason we do invasive species management. And it's also great for our leadership that doesn't see invasive species in the same light that all of us do. So I think that, yep, last slide. So that's all I got. So thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a great presentation. I'm glad we were able to get it in. Thanks to those of you that are hanging out with us. I know we're running a little long, but really appreciate you sticking around because we just wanted to we wanted to share this information. And so again, apologize for some of the tech difficulties. I promise to get Jeremy in a very intense Zoom training ASAP. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Anyway, we do have a couple of questions. So I would love to just have, and if you need to go, you know, you can catch the replay on our uh, YouTube channel, but I'd love to, Jeremy, if you could stop your share and we can invite our speakers back up. I think most of our questions are about Hydrilla and directed for Greg. So hopefully Greg's still with us here. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, I see um, the questions. <laughs> yeah. So do swans or ducks uproot and eat hydrilla turions in more than incidental amounts? I think you answered your own question in a way. It is incidental as far as I can tell. You can see the amount of hydrilla that was in those videos. It would take some serious flocks of ducks and geese and to have any effect at all. Might, you know, they may eat a little bit and 
you know, we do worry about fragments, you know, more that if, if a fragment gets on a duck or a goose or whatever, or even uh, a turion could potentially pass through the digestive system intact, you know, that it could be a method of spreading it to other places. But as far as I can tell, that would be very incidental. Any type of control you'd get from that type of wildfowl. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question for Greg. As you know, hydrilla is on the federal noxious weed list and hydrilla is responsible for killing bald eagles. Does Connecticut get assistance from USDA APHIS to limit its spread? That's a good question. Obviously it is banned, a uh, banned plant and I don't know how much assistance we get other than, you know, because of it being banned for, it is not being allowed to be sold, be moved, be sold as an aquarium trade, say that sort of thing. So I don't know the, I mean, that's, we have other people here who deal with, you know, the APHIS issues, but I'm not aware of, you know, a big presence in the USDA uh, with this particular plant, other than more of a general nature with invasive species. So, you know, I don't know if that answers that question, but I, I don't think we get a lot, but I could be wrong on that since you know, I don't really handle that end of it. Okay, thank you. All right, a question for Jeremy or Mike. What is a bubble curtain? Can you talk just for a minute about what that is and, and what that does? You got it or you want me to, Mike? So we've got some experience using bubble curtains to help control flowering rush. And we did an experiment with it here in the Buffalo, New York area with trying to control hydrilla. And you know, one of the challenges that we have in systems with a lot of moving water is maintaining an herbicide concentration that's sufficient to kill the target plant without having to use lots and lots of herbicide because of that high water exchange, right? Whether it's a, a river or certain parts of lakes, things of that nature, All right? So one, a traditional way to try and get around that is to use a traditional limno corral, right? Like a PVC or vinyl type curtain that you put around the plot that you want to treat and then you apply the herbicide inside that and the curtain maintains that water in there long enough so that the herbicide can kill the plants. But they're kind of costly and not easy to work with. So we've done some trials with using bubbles, right? If you can put down some hose and pump air through it, create a, a bubble curtain that effectively does the same thing that a physical curtain can do. Right, at least that's the hypothesis. And we're working with using those in different settings. Again, try and use less herbicide, have less unintended consequences, implement projects more efficiently. So we've got money to spend on other things. Great. Okay. How has the intensity of infestation of hydrilla been estimated? Is there a specific methodology for estimating infestation of aquatic weeds? And if so, where are those standards? Oh, I guess I can take it. There, There is different methodology, and I, there is, as far as I know, not one standard methodology. In our work on the river, we, we knew a couple of things. Well, number one, there was a, it was a lot of miles of river, over 200 miles. We had to do something that was efficient, and that gave a pretty good estimate of acreages and abundances. So our methodology was to pretty much travel the river using a GPS system on the boat. It was very accurate and we'd actually uh, circumnavigate every patch, estimate the depth, estimate the abundance on a one to five scale visually, and that would all go into the uh, computer system on the boat. We also did over 500 what's called transect points that we can go back the year where we did actual grapple tosses and you know, and, and, and estimated abundances and that sort of thing from those points. That's how we do it. There's a lot of other methods out there. A lot of people strictly will use grid points and that sort of thing. And I, we think that's important, particularly in the more, when you, as you get further into the researching of control and that sort of thing. But yeah, there really isn't a standard method. There's a few different methods that are being used by us and others. And I think they all work. It's, it's just a matter of which one you're choosing. Say so Elizabeth, I can add on to what Greg was saying. The Journal of Aquatic Plant Management in 2018 produced and published a research methods article. And a lot of what Greg has said is captured in some of those articles. You know, there, there's not really one standard survey method, but there's a number of them out there that can be chosen to fit different questions. So depending upon what the researchers or stakeholders or whatever they're doing as far as surveying, 
there's different methods that can be used and those methods i guess are kind of standardized over apm issues so i would encourage people to go on to our website and now the the research methods issue is fully available to the general public so they can click on each individual article and access those for their own use oh that's awesome great thank you so much for that all right can hydrilla be skimmed and used to create biomass energy production I'll answer it. I'm sure some others may have other uh, add some input. Well, these aquatic plants are well over 90% water uh, when you pull them out. So to use them for energy, you, know, you obviously got to dry off the water and realize you've lost 90% of the weight, you know, at that point. And then what you have left could potentially be used for energy. Not impossible, but it's probably better ways of getting energy. But I guess if it's something you have anyway for another reason, and maybe it could be used for that, I'd like to hear what some of the others have to say. So I, I can add, uh, um, not just hydrilla, but I think what you run into often, and we've been through a couple exercises with whether it's energy or using it to, I mean, at one point we're going to harvest water hyacinths for right like the transportation costs that come in when you start thinking about moving it from a system to a place where it can be used for exactly what greg said like it just it gets so cost prohibitive so quickly because of the handling and the man hours and everything that goes with that and then to his point i feel those 90 percent water high since the same way right they're just it's tough to have enough material that you can Board to move because you're going to burn a lot of diesel getting it to do whatever you want to do right boats trucks all that stuff and then you lose 92 percent of what you got to start with it just it nothing we've ever looked into ever made cost effective sense to do anything with at that point at that you know at a biomass level okay thank you all right this is for anyone <clears throat> nearly all aquatic invasives are associated with dams would it help to also work on dam removal and increasing river flow. Everybody's got an opinion and some science here. So, but I'll start, I would say St. John's River in Northeast Florida has the least amount of damming and flood control of anything that we at the Corps of Engineers work with that I'm familiar with. And we spray about 4,000 acres of invasive plants a year. There's no dams. They're there. They want to be there. They're they're capitalizing on the fact that they don't have any natural enemies here, right? Once the species is introduced, um, them or not, they're pretty effective. That's the reason they're invasive. And, and I know that sounds sarcastic to a point, but it's, I don't, I mean, dams do cause a bottleneck, but if they're or not, if you bring the species in and it's going to thrive, it's going to thrive with or without the dam. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Have any surveys been conducted to determine if current infestations of Hydrilla verticillata in the Connecticut River also have the cyanobacterium, oh, I'm gonna probably embarrass myself trying to pronounce that, a, you probably know, Greg, <laughs> but the cyanobacterium that has been linked to vacular myelinopathy in bald eagles of the Southeast. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question. And we are, we're fully aware of that. There was a recent science article that came out that sort of reinforced a previous science article, you know, sort of stressing the uh, importance of the cyanobacteria that's associated with hydrilla and its negative effects on wildfowl, particularly bald eagles. In the Connecticut River, there's lots and lots of bald eagles. And it's a, it's a concern we have not done any studies yet on the cyanobacteria. We have, and in fact, with the Army Corps now is doing some DNA work on various uh, strains of hydrilla in the area, and we're participating in that. We have mentioned to them, would, you know, would they be able to do some DNA work for the cyanobacteria on the samples we send? And uh, they said it was interesting, but we're not sure whether where that's going to go. But we are looking into getting out there and doing um, DNA work on the hydrilla and any potential bacteria that's associated with them because, you know, there's this issue. I mean, the most recent science article was a little bit uh, of an issue because 
it linked the uh, cyanobacteria and its problem and the problematic nature of it with as a neurotoxin with higher you know, increased levels of bromine in the water. And most people say, well, what, what is that? Does, you know, what does that mean? Well, one thing it could mean is that some of our treatments, particularly with diquat dibromide, diquat might be looked at in a little bit of a different way. They're, in the article, they suggested that, but they did not have any good evidence to support it. So the answer is we're, we are very aware of it, but we are looking into how to look into it in more detail, and there'll be more to come on that subject. Okay, thank you. All right, two more, and then we'll and then we'll call it. Are these educational? So this is for the army. Are the educational traveling trunks available for purchase by other outreach groups, or could they be borrowed, perhaps? Borrowed, one hundred percent. Yeah, just email Mike and I. We'll, we can get you in touch with someone that will loan you one. I don't know. We've kind of put them together piecemeal, right? We had an original kit. And it had like 10 species in it and a, a flashcard deck. And then over time we've added, I don't know that, I guess the contractor could make one for somebody if they really wanted to, but I don't know it'd be way easier to borrow ours and just run with it. We would happily share. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Last question. In areas where hiking in and using backpack sprayers have been the only control efforts or control methods, have drones shown usefulness in those control efforts? The places that you can't drive to. I mean, I guess for us, drone usefulness has been more in the survey end of it, right? And it is that like, well, you can't drive there. Let's put this up in the air and see what's on the other side of the river kind of thing. We haven't the core, at least, we haven't got much into drone treatment. I know it's coming. I know it's very real. But at the end, what we do right now is you just walk further, right? It's a backpack sprayer, four gallons of water, and it's a hike. And it's sweaty, hard work. But we do, we have been very effective in learning how to do our treatments better or seeing where we need to treat first and where we need to look first with drones. Treatment in, like actually using them from spraying, we haven't done a lot yet. But it's coming to a project near you. Okay. Any final thoughts from any of our speakers? Uh, anything you want to add before we conclude here? I want to thank APMS. You know, I, I, I so... I'm grateful for not just the time to present, but you all stayed an extra 25 minutes and we have over 90 people that stayed with us. So this is obviously a really important topic as I know I, I'm an aquatic plant person myself and boy, I, I need to keep up with what's going on with APMS. So much good stuff. Loved the case studies that Jeremy and Michael presented and really appreciate that in-depth presentation on hydrilla in the Connecticut River, something we want to stay on top of and keep helping to share that story because that's a, it's a really important thing that we need to keep, keep on the forefront of everybody's minds. So for all of you that are all here, again, thank you for your time and your participation. Wherever you're at, please give these amazing speakers a round of applause from home, from work, from the boat ramp, wherever you're at today. Tomorrow, we have our final webinar of the week, one o'clock central. We'll be hearing about the Western Weed Action Plan and a really important new piece of research from Dr. Jacob Barney out of Virginia Tech looking at how state weed lists compare across the country. So again, thank you so very much to our speakers. Thanks to Molly Bodie for making sure that we could get everybody seen and heard today. And again, APMS, Aquatic Plant Management Society, we're so grateful for the collaboration. We look forward to more opportunities to collaborate. Everybody go check out their website and all the great offerings they have. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.